Hi. My name's JC McCauley. I'm Naisha McCauley, and well, you're, you're watching, watching accesstv.org. Speaker Jim Amon, and welcome to Then and Now. I'm very, very pleased to have a great guest here today, Chief Elke from the Skatakote Tribal Nation. Chief, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's nice always, to be here with you. It's always great seeing you, too. Um, I think it's very important that uh, the citizens of Connecticut, they, they should know their history, but certainly your history here is one that I'm sure many residents don't know, but they should, because um, as we grow as a community and embracing one another, certainly understanding one's history is important uh, to how you move forward. Um, I will tell you, Chief, that uh, I do remember the debate, I was a legislator at the time, uh, when you were trying to get federal recognition back in the 90s and then in uh, 2004. Can you give us a brief history of what happened uh, and when you did actually receive your federal recognition? Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, first, let me state for the record, our reservation is in uh, northeast, northwestern Connecticut, and we have over 400 acres today uh, of a reservation that still exists. Uh, however, you know, through time, uh, land has been taken away from us, but uh, we're in the process of trying to recoup that. And in the uh, 1990s, late 1990s, uh, we were filing for our federal recognition. At that point, uh, we were accepted in 2004. It took a good period of time. It went from 1981 from the time we filed a letter of intent until the time we have the final decision. And it was over 55,000 pages of documentation that we submitted to show that we had the right to be federally recognized. So in 2004, after we became federally recognized, uh, the state of Connecticut legislators fought very vigorously to have that stripped from us. Let me st let me stop you there for a moment. First of all, it's intriguing to me that I think most people don't realize um, in, or in order for a tribal nation uh, to prove that they're a tribal nation, that, that to me is amazing in itself, um, but uh, a 20, almost I guess almost a 23 year process it took, correct? Mm -hmm. It's about 30 in total. About 30. So, yeah. I mean, I can imagine, you know, uh, the time, the documentation, et cetera. And what my understanding is, and I know you were going somewhere and what happened after you got federally recognized, but I understand that your tr particular tribe was uh, had more documentation than uh, some of the existing tribes that we know of uh, here in the state. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Yeah, that that's really, really something that people should uh, should understand. Um, so, okay, so back to your point in 2004, uh, you were finally, after 30 years of work, 55,000 pages of documentation that you were a tribe, you finally do get fed, federally recognized by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and our federal government. And then, like you said, what happened? In the state of Connecticut, after all that work, what happened here? Well, first, I'll correct myself. It was 23 years that, through the petition area. I say over 30 years because it still continues today. Gotcha. It's not oh, over with. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. And, and what happened was uh, when the Bureau of Indian Affairs looked at our petition, overwhelmingly they said it was the best petition that they ever seen filed with their department. And it stated uh, from Oreen Martin, who was the secretary of Department of Interior at that time. So we did what was asked for, to be done. We followed the rules, their guidelines, and even though we didn't appreciate it, we went through it. But after we got federal recognition, the state, as I said, fought very vigorously to have it stripped from us. And what that meant was uh, a lot of injustice as far as my tribe is concerned. Uh, we, we had to do things that no other tribe ever had to do. We had to face the, uh, the uh, hearings in, in, the, uh, in Washington, D.C. 
on why we should have uh, our federal recognition. And the state of Connecticut was just, you know, look, we're a small tribe. How can we fight a state and all the bureaucrats in it? It's impossible for us to do. And they were successful. They had a strip. We were the first tribe ever to have the recognition stripped once it had been granted through the process that we had gone through. Simultaneously, uh, the uh, Eastern, uh, Pog- uh, Eastern uh, Pequots was also stripped from their recognition, too. So it was two tribes that they were trying to keep down. I don't want to go on with this, but we feel the purpose was over gaming. There was no other reason because both tribes had proved without a shadow of a doubt that the federal government had had recognized us. So because of a gaming issue and the two other tribes in the state of Connecticut already having a gaming facility, uh, at the time the state did not want to expand any more gaming. And we would have had the right to do it along with Eastern still. Yeah, which is pretty amazing to me. Again, that the uh, the state, after all that work, you know, for whatever was the politics, protecting existing tribes, whatever the reasoning was, it was an injustice. And I'm glad that you're continuing to to fight, and I'm glad that I'm part of it, Chief, quite frankly. Um, But that wasn't the only time you were dealt an injustice, unfortunately, by the state of Connecticut. Um, way back in the 1700s, can you give a little history? You see, you now have far 400 acres of land, but obviously there was a time where you had actually more acreage. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, we had well over 2,500 acres at the time. Uh, that property was outlined to us in 1736 uh, by the Connecticut General Assembly. And over the years, they started chipping away where, as I said today, we exist of over a little over 400 uh, acres. That land was taken from us, okay? It was our land. We were never compensated for it whatsoever. So today, you know, obviously we have a, a suit against the state of Connecticut claiming that they owe us on the land that was taken from us in, in monetary value, not, not in the land itself. I think dollars. that's a very, very important point because we had a similar debate with another tribe years ago and that certainly scared a lot of folks that uh, their land was going to be taken away from them. Um, But the point is, you know, it wasn't injustice. It was something that the state of Connecticut dealt with with the tribe supposedly in good faith and unfortunately the state legislature way back in the 1700s, they didn't honor their uh, their part of it. In fact, if, if I'm not mistaken, Chief, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think there was a question of the person that was overseeing the money that we never quite find out, found out where that money is today, correct? Yeah, it, it is a, a, a case that is in court yeah. today, so you have to be careful on correct. how far I would go with sure. it. But uh, uh, we hope to, to have, uh, we already showed standings in the court on, on this suit. So we're in uh, good shape. Uh, with the court as far as that's concerned today. But we don't know what, what else is going to be needed. The state is still, you know, defending themselves. But uh, we feel that we have the evidence uh, that would show different, that it was taken, uh, and we were never compensated from the state over that. Good. Well, I wish you uh, a lot of luck with that. Um, i got to ask you one more quick question. Uh, there's been a de- debate, obviously, unless you were sleeping in Connecticut, about a casino in South Windsor, um, the other two tribes were going to be leaving the reservation to build uh, a casino on commercial property. Um, Next segment, we're going to talk about that a little bit, but uh, you just, you supported an open process, correct? That's right, and I still do uh, support an open and fair process, not just open. Good. We want it to be fair. And when you say open process, what does that, what does that mean? Well, right now, there's a monopoly here in the state of Connecticut on gaming. It's not open. Either you have to be a mash and talk at Mohegan in order to have gaming. You've got to open it to everyone. MGM is putting a bid in Bridgeport. You know, uh, Scatter Cook had uh, studied Bridgeport for a good period of time. And we never crossed that off of our map neither. So that's the open process, not, not allowing just the two individual, the two privileged tribes. All right, to have their say, and everything would go their way. No, it should be competition, and we can offer it. Well, I think you're absolutely right. 
you know, as a former legislator, um, yes, there's been years of having a good relationship with the existing tribes, but that didn't give them exclusive right uh, to be a monopoly on gaming in the state. I was there during that debate. I don't remember that any, anywhere in our paperwork. We have had a good working relationship, but it's about the citizens of Connecticut and the taxpayers. Your position is well taken that we should have the right to find out what is the best deal on the table for the state of Connecticut and its citizens. Folks, we're going to be uh, leaving for a moment. Uh, again, I'm Speaker Jim Amon. Uh, we are with Chief Felke from the Scatico Tribal Nation, and we'll be right back to talk further on this uh, awesome subject of gaming uh, in the state of Connecticut. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jay Stan McCauley, and I'm exploring a run for mayor of the city of Hartford in the 2019 election. It's undeniable that Hartford has many challenges. However, I believe that our residents are our strength. The question is, do you believe like I do in the potential of Hartford? You see the many assets the city has, but do you wonder, as I do, why we are still struggling to move ahead? Do you wonder why the solutions being offered to us just don't seem to get the job done? Well, creating a vibrant city begins with you. We have incredible people who live in the city, who have great solutions to Hartford's biggest challenges. But you don't always have a platform to have your ideas heard, let alone given an opportunity to co-create solutions that work for you, that work for us, that work for Hartford. Hartford's journey will be bumpy and we'll continue to face highs and lows that challenge us to work smarter and come together as a community that is willing to capitalize on the power of our collective diversity of thought. The challenges facing Hartford will require each of us to act, whether in small ways or big ones. If you're with us on this journey, give me a call at 860-944-9797 and host a listening event for me. Invite a few of your friends so we can explore the possibilities together for a better Hartford. from the Scatcoat Tribal Nation. I have to clarify, I apologize. Uh, I said South Windsor. I really would probably confuse some people that might be listening, but the casino is actually, uh, they're trying to build is in East Windsor. So my apologies for any confusion on that. Um, Chief, we were talking about the open process. We were talking about, you know, why transparency is better than a monopoly. Can we uh, discuss that a little bit more as far as your viewpoint goes? Sure, thank you. Uh, you know, first off, Mashantucket Mohegans, to be congratulated. They, they stood behind their agreement. Uh, they gave the state some uh, 8 or $9 billion uh, in revenue from, from their slot machines, which was their agreement that they had made with the state. So they stood behind agreement. It was great. They had this uh, agreement now with the state for over 20 years. And just like everything else, it comes time for a change. I believe the time for the change is now. When they want to go to East Windsor, they're leaving their reservation. So they become commercial. They're no longer just a tribe, tribal identity here in the state. So when it becomes commercial, it needs to be opened up in a commercial form to everybody. Let the bidding come in. Let the people who can uh, uh, finance a gaming facility come in and see what they can offer the state. I realize what's on the table here for the state of Connecticut is a guaranteed X amount of million dollars from each of the tribes. 
But if a casino is to open up in Bridgeport, it might really make the difference of what's going to happen. Well, that's a very good, very good point. Maybe we'll segue into that. But if you don't mind, since our segment is then and now, I'm going to go back to a little bit of history. Chief, I know that you were around at the time uh, back in the uh, 90s, 94, 95. There was a casino discussion way back when. Um, you know, you make a very good point. That's probably one of the reasons why as we've moved forward in, in our friendship and knowing each other, uh, that we were on the same page then, we're on the same page now. Listen, I was there during the debate. We gave it to them fair and square, the uh, Mohegans and, and the Pequots. They got it. Their agreement was tribal lands. But I felt the same way. All right, now we're talking about Bridgeport. Well, you're off tribal, you're off the tribal lands now. It has to be an open bid process if you want to if you want to participate. As you know, we had a lot of good um, casino developers come in. Uh, we have President Trump uh, came in when we had uh, Steve Wynn from Wynn Resorts and many others that thought Pritchwell would be a, a super spot. Um, put on your uh, your old time hat there in the 90s and uh, where, where were you back then? What were you thinking about the, the conversations? And then we'll talk about what's happening now. Sure, our, our conversations were with the mayor of Bridgeport at the time. We started uh, our conversation with Mayor Ganim at the time he was the mayor on his uh, first term as mayor. He supported uh, the Scattercook tribe as long as we were able to bring some development into his city, which made perfect sense to us. So after Mayor Ganim, the next two mayors, uh, Fabrizi and then Mayor Finch, they also supported the Scattercook Tribal Nation in their area. You know, they weren't giving us anything. They they wanted uh, work for their people. We were looking at the possibility and probability of anywhere from five to 9,000 jobs in in that vicinity, What in, just in there. So now, after Mayor Ganim comes back and takes over again, he is still interested in building his city and having a, a facility uh, come in such as what we had talked about in his first administration comparison to what MGM is offering them today. It mirrors to what we would do and what they would do. It would just be who would come in to do it and what's the state want to do. And in this year's uh, legislature, um, we had uh, a great discussion on what exactly, you know, open process versus closed process. Can you elaborate on what happened uh, during the legislative process uh, of building a casino in Bridgeport, whether it be on a closed process and monopoly versus an open process um, uh, for, for, a, for a bid RFQ for the uh, casino? Well, it was like everything else that happens when it gets into legislative legislation. You know, things go back and forth. Uh, I think the, for the open process, people brought in very good reasoning on why it should be. You know, first off, if there's going to be another casino in the state of Connecticut, why shouldn't it help the citizens as much as it helped the two tribes that exist with a gaming facility today? So if they were to go about it in that uh, view, we think without a doubt it would benefit not just the city of Bridgeport, but also the state of Connecticut. We don't think there would be any loss between the two casinos and that casino and what they were compensating. The state needs to take a strong look at what's going on in Massachusetts. You have MGM going in and, and another one in Boston. Once them two casinos are up and running, the uh, two tribe casinos will probably be down to their minimum of contributions to the state of Connecticut. And if that comes about, that's why I say it would equal out whatever they did in Bridgeport. Yeah, there's no doubt because um, many uh, people know that the best market right now probably in the Northeast is the New York market, which if you were able to capture that in Bridgeport, it probably would be one of the better um, profit-making uh, casinos in the state. Um, the other point I wanted to make is that, you know, you, you, you are... Um, in the same position as MGM, both uh, the Scatical Tribal Nation and MGM as a competitor to the existing tribes. 
are coming in here with an open bid process. And I know in the legislature, uh, at the final hours last year, uh, we were dealt a disappointment, uh, but with a lot of work and effort, uh, what we what was really nice for the tribe this year is that even though it was a close vote, it seems like momentum's going in your favor because in the House they did support an open process. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And I, I think probably what happened there was the message started to get out to other people and they were contacting their legislators saying, why aren't we looking at a fair and open process here? Why is it just being narrowed? It does, where does it, the hurt come to any of us here in the state of Connecticut, being the citizens, to take a look at something different? That's fair and open. Take a look at it. If they can show and prove that the state would be damaged, then there's something else. There's no damage here. If anything, there's growth. There's no doubt about it. And in my 30 years in politics and in lobbying, uh, the most important thing that I, as my as a legislator and also as a lobbyist and to my clients, is transparency. The more transparent uh, conversations are, especially when you're dealing with taxpayers' money, mm -hmm. the better. So you're right. Why are people opposed to an open process? I do know and understand that there's a lot of loyalty to the existing tribes. I have many friendships here, too. But business is business. If the, at the end of the day, if Pequots or Mohegan, uh, Scattercoats or MGM or whoever puts the best deal on the table for the citizens of Connecticut, that's what matters. And I know that's how you feel also, correct, Chief? Yes, it is. And, and that's the way it should be. Not, not just in gaming, but anything going on in the state. It has to be for the benefit of us, for the citizens. Right. And if they leave it fair and open, look, if it doesn't work after legislation gets a chance to take a look at it, that's one thing. But I think we're going to prove different. Give it a shot. I agree. Um, the Skeptical Travel Nation, I, I, we're not going to open up the, the playbook here and show exactly what the Skeptical's uh, have in mind, uh, but it's more than, uh, than gaming. It's about economic development. It's about job creation. Uh, yes, a casino is part of it, but if the uh, chief gets his, an opportunity, uh, it really will be a great, great um, project for that end of the state. Um, we're going to be taking another break in a moment. Again, uh, I'm here with Chief Felke from the Skatico Tribal Nation. Uh, my name is Jim Amon, um, former Speaker of the House and the host of Then and Now. You know something? Hartford's strength is the people. They're independent thinkers and love their city. So how did Hartford fall into the hands of rogue policymakers? Well, to start, this rogue group spent nearly one million dollars putting themselves on the inside and leaving you out in the cold. What if I told you that five dollars can be the difference between a Hartford with hope and vision or a Hartford that is in perpetual decline, increasing crime, and an educational system going nowhere fast. Your $5 contribution to our team is a statement that you are investing in Hartford's future. Your $5 contribution to Macaulay for Mayor will make you a member of the team, and together we will explore the possibilities. More than that, you will be demonstrating that Hartford's people are ready to make a stand with Stan. Our goal is to get the support of 5,000 people who live, work, and play in Hartford. I'm asking you to make a bold statement by contributing $5 right now, today. If you believe in Hartford and its people like I do, make that contribution. And together we will show Connecticut that the people of Hartford care enough to do our part. We are ready to pick up the ball and run. The people of Hartford are back in the game. And we're in it to win. My name is Jay Sam McCauley. And I approve this message.
Hi, I'm Jim Heyman, Speaker of the House. Uh, former, I should say, Speaker Emeritus. Look it up in the dictionary. I'm uh, also the host of Then and Now. I'm so honored uh, to be with a good friend of mine, uh, Chief Felke from the Skatico Tribal Nation. Chief, welcome back. Uh, we we're having a nice discussion. We were talking about possible development uh, in the Bridgeport area, a casino. We're talking about other economic uh, development, good job, good paying jobs. But I'm going to uh, divert you back over to uh, East Windsor. Now, I believe two years ago they were given the go-ahead to start to build a, a third casino in the state in East Windsor. What What's happening with that project as we speak? From what I understand, it's sort of flat. Uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, had given a letter to the Mohegans, but not to the Mash and Tuckets. Uh, it's my understanding that their uh, group is called MMCT, not MCT. So I think they have to wait for another letter from Mash and Tuckett. But I know they had this face-off also in the 90s when Mash and Tuckett was going to be building in Bridgeport. Mohegan said they would stop their contributions to the state if that was to happen. So it'd be interesting to see if uh, Mash and Tuckett would take the position if they don't get a clearance and if Mohegan's just open up the uh, East Windsor uh, facility. It's to be uh, yet to come. I think this is very, very interesting because, again, you know, people have busy lives. They pick up the newspaper. They put on, you know, one of the news channels says, he, you know, East Windsor to build a third casino. And uh, the existing tribes are building it. Well, most people go back to their day and they're expecting that there's uh, bricks going up and the casino's coming and and things, hey, I'm mean, going to take a trip out to East Windsor and go uh, play the slots. And they're making plans already. But in reality, it is a stalled project. But more importantly, I, your points that you're making, I think really complicate, you know, what the state did, giving them the okay. The Bureau of Indian Affairs basically saying, well, you know, they sat on it for a while, number one. Uh, then some pressure was put on and they decided to go back and review the files or whatever. But they've given it partial to one tribe and the other tribe nothing. And like you said, this we've been there before. It's deja vu. Uh, I guess, as we talk out loud here, what, let's say that only the, the Mohegan tribe gets BIA, BIA approval and for some other reason uh, Pequots do not. I would assume we're going to have to go back to the General Assembly and start from scratch, I would assume. What do you think? I, I would have to assume it is uh, also because they're in front of the General Assembly under a different uh, LLC being MMCT. So they would have to weigh out the difference there. Yeah, and I think there's probably some legislators, you know, I've been there, done that, uh, that are pro um, closed process will say, oh, it's just simple change of language here or there, have the attorneys write it up, we'll just put it somewhere in the back of the budget and call it a day. But as you know, the people with open process aren't going to let that happen. It's going to be another big debate. It's, it's got to be controversial. they got to start from scratch. So uh, in my humble opinion, I think that that particular third casino uh, is, gonna, is a long time waiting to be built. And there's other things going on with that also besides that complication, correct? Yeah, well, again, it would get back to what we I have been saying right along, a fair and open process. Because if it was open to a fair and open process, if it was MCT or MMCT or STN or MGM <clears throat> or any other name, it'd be a fair and open process for East Windsor too, not not just uh, down in Bridgeport. That's a good point. So, That's a great point. Is there also... Uh, is there other complications right now, too, with that particular project? Are there lawsuits pending? Is MGM still in that, in that battle? Um, can you elaborate on that at all? I, I don't know enough to uh, get into that okay. subject. Not a problem. Um, okay, so let, let's, let's end it on, uh, on a very positive note. I know, you, like you said, we talking about the 23 years and 30 years, but in reality, since you got... Your recognition is stripped again in 2004. You've continued to fight. You haven't gone away. I give you a lot of credit for that, and your tribe certainly is 
um, a tribe that believes in who they are and what direction they want to take and what they want to do. So I, I have to tell you that staying focused like that, um, and I think many legislators have seen that uh, in you, Chief, and in the tribe. The more they get to know you and the tribe, the more I think they embrace uh, what you're trying to do. So why don't you tell us uh, where are we right now with um, going back for a second time for federal recognition? Well, let me just say, uh, we were one of Connecticut's first families, the Scattercook Tribal Nation. Uh, we've been here for well over 300 years because there was a disagreement uh, with the legislation here in Connecticut and they were able to influence a decision out of Washington, D.C. does not make us go away. We're not going anywhere. We've been here for over 300 years. We plan on being here for the next 300 and plus years also. So we continue our pursuit for federal recognition. It hasn't gone away. But in 2015, the Bureau of Indian Affairs had changed their uh, rules and regulations on the process. And in 2015, tribes uh, don't longer need to go back and show the history that we did in order to get our recognition to begin with. What they're asking for now, we can go back to the old rules and we can stay with the new rules. It wouldn't make a difference. We would be successful. But one caveat to that was before they made it and passed it, here in the state of Connecticut, they opposed it. They wanted the words put in, if you had failed once, you can't go back again. Right. Again, here we go with the uh, uh, influence, political influence on, on a, uh, you know, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. If we were to have that same mentality in everything we did, I would throw this out to you, Mr. Speaker. We had a death penalty here in the state of Connecticut. They lifted it. But they didn't say the ones that were still there still had to be executed. They got to stay, okay? But yet, a death penalty was given to my tribe when they said, you no longer had a right to appeal or to challenge this. The, the Eastern Pequots are challenging the fact that it's their constitutional right, and they took away a right of an appeal to them. I say the right was taken away from us, not by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but by the state of Connecticut. And we need to have that restored. We need the citizens to say, look, if these people don't qualify, then they don't qualify. But if they do, then let's stop this and have them recognized like they should be. They were here. If they still have their land, they have the right to be recognized. That's all we're asking for is the same in gaming, a fair process. And it's not there yet. Well, I agree with you, Chief. I know that everything that you and the uh, tribe has done uh, has always been up front. Um, I think probably this time around, first is maybe 2004. I think a lot of the legislators up there, like I said earlier, um, they have a little bit more knowledge of who uh, the Scottsdale Tribal Nation are. They have certainly know and recognize who you are. Um, you go up and you have uh, private conversations with them. You've testified up there. And it, how do you argue open and fair process? Am I right? I don't know. I don't know how they, how do you possibly can argue. Right. You know. Right. And, uh, you know, you've, uh, you've worked hard at what you do, and I, I wish you nothing but success and luck. And I hope the state of Connecticut, uh, once you do get um, recognition again, uh, that they say you played the game fair and you won it fair and square, and we should move forward and let the Scatical Tribal Nation be as equals to the other uh, tribal nations in this state. Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. And I, I think right now there wouldn't be a better time than to move forward as things are happening in this state that we know our tribe can contribute to, just like we did over 300 years ago. Well, thanks, Chief, and thanks for being our guest today. Thank I you. hope you learned a little bit more about the Scatico Tribal Nation, uh, Chief Elke, but more importantly, of the debate that's probably one of the hottest debates going on. You know, I just remembered there's one issue we didn't talk about today, 
which was uh, the whole issue of sports uh, betting. Uh, that is going to be a hot issue too. So, Chief, maybe we'll get you back and we'll talk about that. Sounds good. So, uh, sports you. betting should be exactly the same thing, in my opinion. I, I'm sure the Chief agrees. Uh, it shouldn't be given to one entity, whether it be an existing tribe or whether it should be OTB, whether it be done in lottery, or whether it sits down and it has a new entity to come in and do it. We should all try our best. Thank you.